some of the things that we're looking at is, is can you repeat the question? Yeah, one of the, the summarize that question is is um, how do we kind of compare the information to see which is sort of in a sense of which resources are valued more than others. Uh, that is a comparative analysis that we'll have in the EIS. Um, what we'll do is we'll basically have a lot of tables comparing resource A to B. Um, simply, if there's something that says, okay, uh, maybe a route has a thousand acres of agricultural impacts, where a route has maybe 50 acres of agricultural impacts, uh, seems pretty straightforward that the one route with less acres of agricultural impacts would be less intrusive than the other. Um, the challenge for us becomes when there are, uh, you know, once you start adding more and more resources in there, maybe there's some residential impacts, uh, maybe there's some forestry impacts. Uh, so it becomes a, a balancing impact of, of looking at all those together. And I don't have, I don't have a, a silver bullet answer for you of which one is, is prioritized more highly than the other, um, but certainly you know, what you guys bring up today in our meetings and comments help us prioritize which impacts to look at over the others. After that, yes, uh, I just want to add a little bit about how we do our job and, and how we verify this information, how we make sure that the information given to us is accurate. And earlier in my presentation, I talked a little bit about how we work with local, state, and federal agencies. Uh, we rely on those folks, you know, a lot of them based here in Georgia, to help us with our, our project and our review. Uh, we've met with the Georgia DNR, we're meeting with the Environmental Protection uh, Agency, we've met with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, so we don't do this by ourselves. We are the lead federal agency, but we depend on, on county representatives, municipal representatives, to give us input in the process to, to verify that this information is accurate, and that what we're being told is, is true. So it's a long process, it takes us a while to verify things, and, and that's what my responsibility is, and that's how we do that. So we'll have a, a number of meetings over the course of the next year or so to, to confirm that this information is correct. And this is something that we do every day. I've been doing this uh, National Gas Pipeline Review for over 10 years, so it's, it's my job to, to verify this information. Having done it all across the country, I, I feel very confident when I look at this information that I know what I'm, I'm looking at and what I know what I'm looking at. For. And in, to point out, there's two of us, three of us here from Burke. We probably have a team of about 24 folks assigned to this project. It's going to take us a while. It's a big project, but that, that's how we work a little bit. And we have to answer any other process questions that people might have about what the FERC does and how the FERC reviews the project. You, you said that you would be reviewing what's there now, um, which is important. but. What if there's nothing there, but in hundreds of years, we may have things there? So why is it only considered you, what the last agriculture... Part, I, wasn't really, I wasn't hearing from you from all the way back here. I, I said you mentioned you take into consideration <laughs> when you're doing your review process, you're, you're taking into consideration what's there now, for instance, residential agriculture. Does it really matter what's there right now? Because are we not considering what will be there for years, decades, hundreds of years, and how that land and water is going to be impacted? Yeah, um, I'll take a crack at that. The, uh, for every resource that we look at in the EIS, we look at the current, what's currently there, but we look at what the construction impacts would be, and we would look at the long-term operational impacts. So we would be looking at, for the lifetime of the operation of the pipeline, what those impacts would be. So they would go out for years. So the lifetime of the pipeline. Correct. Yeah, let, let me add to that a little bit. Yeah. You're typically in an environmental uh, impact statement like that, there's three types of impacts. There's the temporary ones, which are pretty short term. You'll see them and then they'll go away. There are kind of midterm impacts. Uh, and we'll define all this in the document. Maybe you know, two to five years, and then there's long-term impacts. If you cut down a tree, it's going to take 30 years to come back. So that, that's a long-term impact. So we do look at that, and what the effects of that long-term impact would be. I'm Dan Bradley from Brooks County. Um, I got a note from uh, Sable Trail here. Um, and uh, recently it, it says that you have the scope that, uh, that you're going to be collecting information for only last 60 days. And that um, they said, please also note that the NOI, which is notice of um, intent, I guess, 
um, for scoping period for comments lasts on 60 days and closes on April the 20th, 2014. Is that correct? Yes, sir, that's correct. We've opened up a 60 day comment period. Uh, the truth is, we'll take comments after 60 days, but we try to get them early in the process. We want to know up front what people are, are concerned about. And typically, I, I just wanted to point out that the scoping process is generally 30 days. But given the, the length of this project and the concerns that we've heard already, we extended it to 60 to make sure that people have time to think about the project and express their concerns to us. So like you said earlier in your um, comment, that it was, uh, something about it lasting a, a year? Our review process, the pre planning process, will last approximately a year. <coughs> and then we would uh, review the project from the certificate application. Questions? My name is Tom Lovett. I also live in Brooks County, and I'm an affected landowner. My question is to the process that is utilized for the approval, and that is you have a staff of 24 in the commission, and then there's five commissioners. Is that correct? And, and is the ultimate decision made by the five commissioners who at some point in time when the review and the uh, process is to the point where they're going to vote on it and then they vote to approve it and approve the route? Is that, is that what happens? Yeah, Correct. let me add to that, Kevin, really quickly. And I should clarify, the commission has a staff of well over a thousand. There are 24 of us from the environmental division dedicated to this project, and as you said, when we're done with our job, the five-member commission will vote on the project, whether to approve or not to approve the project. Uh, so we'll, we'll provide our recommendations. There's other aspects of the commission, the legal and the economic folks that will be working on this project as well, who will also provide input to the commission before they make their decision. And, and a follow-up question. Is your commission one that is going to either approve or not approve the proposed pipeline? <coughs> And or do you have the um, jurisdiction to approve part of it, but not other parts, and and therefore you could require the Sable Trail reroute, move, or relocate uh, part of what they where they want to put the pipeline. Yes, the commission will ultimately approve the project, which includes the project route. Uh, the commission has the ability to approve parts of that not, and not other parts of that. Typically what happens in the review process is if the staff feels that there is a, a better route or a better alternative or a better portion, we would make a recommendation to the condition and then the commission would consider whether or not to approve that recommendation. But the final authority rests with the commission. Okay, thank you. We got a question back here. 